Aubrey Lydon. I am the writer, creative producer, and something or other for Dark Tides, a paranormal actual play podcast that you can find wherever you get podcasts. That's why I am making this video, because I have been running sessions of role-playing games about every week for the last two years straight. It's been a lot, and these are some of the things that I've learned. All right, let's cut to the chase. You want to be a better GM, dungeon master, game master, whatever you're going to call it. I want to be a better one too. Here is what I've been thinking about for about three months. How do I do that? So the main thing is that obviously there is no such thing as a perfect game master. Sorry, Matthew Mercer, it's true, but we can all be better. And here's a few things that I've been figuring out about how you can be better. The main thing to know is that the way that I look at being a good game master is not about running your modules or incredible world building. It's really about giving your players the best possible experience you can give them. So all of my tips and all the things I've been thinking about really are about how you can improve the play experience for your group. Let's get started. Number one, ask your players what kind of game they want before you start prepping anything, because it's important to know. Ask your players what they want out of the game before you start prepping anything. I learned this the hard way. Do it properly, get them in a room, make them sit down, make them make eye contact with each other, and ideally with you. You don't have to make eye contact. You're the GM, you don't have to. And you ask them a bunch of questions. Questions like, what kind of game do you want to play? What system do you want to use? Because it's good to experiment. You don't always have to use your default system or the thing that you as the game master are really comfortable with. You can explore. It's helpful to know what they're expecting and what they're looking for. Different players are gonna want different things, but by meeting together, you can kind of figure it out beforehand so that you don't have a bunch of people really enjoying what you prepare and one or two people really hating it. So you try and figure out the genre, whether it's gonna be a heist game, a mystery, political intrigue, adventure, Indiana jones it, and then you figure out sort of characters. This is really the best time to start doing character creation is before you prep anything, because then you get a preview of what the party's gonna look like, the kind of characters that they might have, that they might want, and then that way you're building the story around them, not just building the story and then slotting the characters in later. Oh yeah, one caveat. If the players, you know, want something fun and lively and, you know, easygoing, you don't want to be over in the corner crafting your little story of political intrigue. It's just not going to work. So to save yourself the heartache, you want to be really straightforward with people. But if it is going to be a suspense game or a mystery game, you don't want to give them all that information beforehand. Important. Number two, know the scope of your game before you start prepping things. It's important to do. Pin down your players and actually ask them how much time they're willing to commit to this game. If it's only a couple of weeks, you're writing something really pretty small. So you're not gonna waste heaps of time preparing something you're not gonna use. If they want months, if they want years, better quit your day job, you're gonna need those hours. Number three, know the rules and know when to bend them. As Kenny Rogers sort of once said, and I'm not very good at this one. I tend to be too loose with the rules. My players can attest to this and they get away with way too much stuff. But you also don't want to be a rules tyrant. So you've got to find the happy medium for your group where you're not putting them through a gauntlet, trying to be the enemy while they're trying to hang on to their character and keep them alive. But you also don't want to be the DM that just lets them get away with everything, often murder. Instead, you want to know when to bend those rules. My personal preference is when you see a character winding up into a big moment that's important for their development, the players are really behind it, people are really focused, let them have that hero moment. Let them do the cool thing and, you know, make them roll with advantage. Maybe don't make them roll at all. Let them have that moment. But, and this is important, after you've been DMing for long enough, you start to figure out exactly when it's good to let them fall on their face because it keeps them humble. And sometimes that's better for the character overall and it's more entertaining, but you've got to figure it out. What I'm saying is use your discretion. Just 
Use your discretion and don't be a tyrant. Number four, prep significant locations before time. Really helpful. This is something that I've been doing pretty much since I started GMing. I would go through the module I was running or the homebrew that I was working on and I'd figure out all of the significant locations. And that meant stuff like where the NPCs would be, the important ones, the ones that you would visit a lot, uh, locations that were gonna be plot heavy or that the characters might return to a bunch of times. And I would write out descriptions for them beforehand. That way I could just whip out the piece of paper that I had and I could give a cinematic reading of where this place was and I would try and include things like the location, the weather, the textures, the smells, the sounds, try to build a really real picture in the player's heads. That way, whenever we return to it, I could use some of that dialogue again and really kind of snap them back into where we are at that moment. And it makes you sound cool and you know, like you're a well thought out person and you're good at this. It's also helpful to have a map, especially if you're gonna have enemies, clues, treasure, just a little sketched out pencil thing. Works great. I'm sure a lot of you already do this, but it was something that I thought was important. Number five, have a list of NPC names and character details that you can pull from whenever you're surprised by needing a new NPC. This is a good one and one that it's taken me way too long to figure out I needed. You're always gonna run into situations where the characters wanna talk to someone that you didn't know existed, or you have to invent an NPC on the fly to fill some little hole. So what I do now is that I have a big spreadsheet full of random character names. Some of them are really dumb, some of them are really normal. It doesn't honestly matter. That way, when your players run up to a stall and go, hey, I wanna to talk to this vendor, I can just pull out the piece of paper and go, ah, oh, their name is such and such, bing bong mcshmong, it doesn't matter. But the other thing that's helpful is to actually have a sheet of different descriptors, things like their appearance, a characteristic about them and their voice. You can make it more detailed if you want it more detailed. You can give them goals, aspirations, fears, whatever you like. And then I would roll on that table and I'd just get three or four things. That way I could quickly make this character a little more distinctive than just a name, but it's helpful. And you can do it with locations too. You can do the same thing if, oh, I need a pub. Oh, I need a supermarket. Oh, I need whatever else. You can just sort of prepare yourself in a more thought out way. Number six, you have to perform. Perform. Now I know that a lot of you, stay still. I know that a lot of you probably don't want to perform. This is an introvert's hobby mostly, or at least I'm very introverted and I don't want to perform. And I know a lot of GMs that don't really want to perform. But the problem is if you're the game master, you are setting the tone. You're setting the pace. You are setting the culture of your group and how you play. Now admittedly, your characters, your players, all of that plays into the same thing of how these games go. But as the GM, you have a lot of power to change the way that you come at this. So if you're performing, your players are gonna perform more. And especially those players that are newer, that are maybe shyer, that don't feel quite as comfortable role-playing or getting really invested. If you're performing, you'll make it safe for them to perform as well. So for me, performing looks like doing voices, trying to do lots of different voices. Uh, it means a level of physical acting while I'm doing NPCs that kind of makes them more alive. Uh, it's also about how you speak, whether you're highly energetic and whether you're giving a lot of description and enthusiasm around the different events. You don't want to be the GM that's reading off of the page or the laptop screen verbatim in a droning voice. That's not going to help anyone get immersed in this world. And really, all of your players want this to be an immersive experience. No one wants this to be bland. So if you perform, they'll perform too. Number seven, set the tone before you begin the session by using music. Now I know that a lot of DMs like to use music in the sessions to give atmosphere, to maybe make things more exciting. I do this too when I can, but I often forget. So I start doing it and then I kind of peter out. But I found that it's really helpful if you use music before you begin. And the way that I do that now is I actually ask my players to stop to be quiet, not to check their phones, even to close their eyes and to listen to 
a minute, two minutes of music that set the tone. The reason I do this is because my players get really hyped up on sugar and socializing before we play and they get silly. If you just start the game that way, the silly just continues through. That's fine if you're playing a goofy, fun campaign, no problem. But if you want it to be serious, if it was supposed to be a serious game, or most importantly of all, if some of the players really want it to be serious and other ones are goofing around, this is a helpful way of providing a gap between the silliness and the game itself. It kind of helps people slip into the character and remember what they're doing. So yeah, use some music. Use different songs for different sessions, depending on what you're gonna be doing. It really helps. Number eight, engage the players by asking them lots and lots of questions. This is a really helpful one and it takes some of the burden off you as the GM having to improvise everything on the fly. A really good way of doing this practically, screaming bird. A really good way of doing this practically is when you get to a location, you're introducing the location, ask the players what they notice. So let's say they're walking through a crowded market, ask them what kind of stalls they see, if there are any interesting people, if there's something that they notice about the location that they're in and incorporate those things. Let them interact with the things that they bring into the game. This really helps them to stay focused and helps them to be invested in the world, not just their characters. It also brings things to life a little more and it adds a variety that wouldn't be there if it's only your imagination building the world for them. Another helpful thing, actually, on that note, is ask them lots of questions about their character. What kind of clothes are they wearing? Give me details. What does the stitching look like? What are the colors? What are the, the mismatched pieces of clothing? Ask them what gear they have, why they have that specific gear. If they have an important object or item that's significant to the character, ask them why they have that, who gave it to them, where it came from, why they keep it. When they're gonna go out and eat together, ask them what food they get, why that food. Ask them what drinks they like, if they choose not to drink. It really helps to just sort of set the world in stone and give it some grounding. Number nine, know when to read the room. I know that for me as a game master, I can get very in my own head about what's going on and the next story event that's coming up and thinking about all of these sort of things. And I can forget to pay attention to my players. If you notice that a bunch of them are on their phones, it means they're not engaged. Not that that's a terrible thing. They're allowed to check out a little bit, but you don't want them to be bored. And especially if you're neglecting one player who hasn't had something to do in quite a while if you've been focusing too much, if you're splitting the party and you're giving a lot of attention to one side and not the other, you wanna read the room and that means that you can respond. Sometimes that means you take a 15 minute break, let everyone get away from the table for a minute, refresh, come back, refocus. Maybe it means you need to change things up. You throw in an unexpected fight or a plot twist or a clue or something that just livens things up a bit. But if you're not paying attention, you won't know that you need to do those things. Again, this is about giving your players the best possible experience you can. And finally, number 10, don't get bogged down. Don't forget to be creative. I find this especially when I'm running a module that's pre-written or if I'm- Stop doing fantasy. No more dragons. No more dragons. Sorry, D&D. You're boring. All right, you don't have to get tied down to the genre that you're in. If you're doing fantasy, you can do a lot of different stuff other than traditional Western style fantasy. If you're doing sci-fi, you can do a lot of things that don't normally fit into the sci-fi genre. But it's the same as if you're doing, you know, a particular style of campaign. If it's really serious, don't be afraid to throw in some dumb, goofy characters or a weird spin-off into something else. This is meant to be fun for everyone and especially for the people who are really, really engaged. So if you're feeling bogged down and like, oh, I've got to get through a bunch of this narrative stuff before I can get to something that's fun, or if you're halfway through a campaign and you're bored of the campaign, talk to your players. Suggest doing something different, taking a left turn, throw the characters through a portal into a different universe where you switch systems. It's really okay to do that. I mean, it's not okay in my case where I'm running a podcast and there has to be some kind of like narrative sense to everything that you do, 
but most of the time you can just do that sort of stuff and you know have fun with it that's all i've got you can go now oh yeah that's probably important i don't plan to make a heap of these videos i've got other stuff going on in my life if you want me to do other videos about really specific stuff uh building your own rpg systems which i have done and continue to continue doing uh, if you want me to do things on character or plotting or world creation, doing maps, let me know in the comments. I'm probably not going to do them unless you ask for them or unless I really want to do them, in which case it doesn't matter whether you want them. But yeah, if you want stuff, let me know. If you have more questions, if you need more examples about any of the things that I've talked about, let me know and I can do specific videos on just like, hey, here's how you, you use music or I use music. Here's how I do setting. Here's how you keep your players in line and smack them down when they're getting too cocky, you know? All right, if you want to know what my qualifications are for giving you all this advice, I am the game master and the creative producer, maybe, of Dark Tides, which is a paranormal actual play podcast, which I created, and I created the game system that it runs on. If you want to check out the podcast, you can find it wherever you get podcasts by searching for Dark Tides. Um... We also have a Patreon where you can see more of us doing exactly those things. Uh, you can go to patreon.com slash darktides or darktidespod, I forget, but you'll find it. Um, yeah, this is good. At the time that this is coming out, we're probably releasing our third-ish season, which is a prequel run by Chester, who, if you know the show, you will know very well and you know that he likes horror. Uh, it's a bit of a step away from our normal show. It's very Stephen King-esque and quite uh, emotionally intense, I would say. So if you're into that, you can check that out without having seen the rest of the show. Otherwise, go back to season one.